How does power affect behavior and the brain? American psychologist Dacher Keltner has spent more than two decades researching that question. And with the recent deluge of sexual assault reports by men in high places, we were hoping he could shed some light on the power of power. So joining us now on the line from Berkeley, California, Dacher Keltner, professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and the author of The Power Paradox, How We Gain and Lose Influence. Uh, Professor Keltner, it's good of you to join us tonight on TVO. Before we sort of study what you've been up to, uh, let's try to define it. I always thought power was the ability to persuade. Why don't you embellish on that and tell us what you're thinking of when you refer to power? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most complicated questions in the science of power. I mean, is power money? Is it coercion? Is it Machiavellianism? And as a psychologist, we wanted to define power in ways that help us understand uh, power in families and at work life and in many different contexts. So we define power as your capacity to influence other people. So it's a little bit like persuasion, but it's broader, which is how much can you influence other people around you? Okay, let's get into it. This is a quote yeah. from your book. My own research has found that people with power tend to behave like patients who have damaged their brain's <laughs> orbitofrontal lobes, a condition that seems to cause overly impulsive and insensitive behavior. Thus, the experience of power might be thought of as having someone open up your skull and take out that part <laughs> of your brain so critical to empathy and socially appropriate behavior. How does that metaphorical damage that you just described actually happen? Well, you know, so one of the things that we've learned in 20 years of studying power is it, is it does pretty reliably make you more impulsive, and we can sort of deconstruct that if you want to. And then it, it kind of knocks out your ability or diminishes your ability to empathize with other people, to feel compassion, to know carefully what other people are thinking. And your question is, well, how does that happen, right? Mm -hmm. And one way in which it happens is within your mind when you feel powerful, there's a shift from thinking about what other people are interested in, and you tend to prioritize instead your own interests and desires and the thoughts in your mind. So you become a little bit more narcissistic. And then I think the, the other thing that we often lose sight of is one of the reasons that you see abuses of power in every imaginable context, and really over history, is the social context kind of enables the abuses of power. People around you when you feel powerful don't hold you accountable. They don't critique you. They don't uh, sort of make sure that you're behaving in a, in a more ethical way. So why do we abuse power? One is the psychological processes in your mind, and then another is what's happening out, outside in your social context. Did you have a kind of a eureka moment in your lab where you discovered, oh my goodness, I've got it now. Power decreases empathy, and here's how I prove it, and now I know why. Yeah, you know, it's been so fascinating, Steve, to study power for the past 25 years, and there are these eureka moments. Uh, one was, you know, very early in my study of power, um, I brought fraternity guys to my lab in groups of four, and I had them tease each other, right? And there were high power guys in the fraternities. These are social groups on U.S. college campuses that have pretty clear hierarchies. So I had high power guys tease each other low power guys tease each other in these groups of four. I was at the experiment and the high power guys were so profane and lewd and swearing and saying things within the context of an experiment, just showing this impulsivity. Uh, that really jumped out at me. And then another eureka moment, you know, and we always have to think about not only what does power do to people feeling powerful and power holders, but we have to also think about, and I think this is even a more important part of the equation, if I feel powerless, if I feel like I don't have esteem or influence in the social context, uh, which is a very serious concern when it comes to sexual harassment and, and U.S. politics, in fact, um, what happens to me when I feel less powerful? And there what we were starting to see early in our studies is if I feel less powerful, I'm stressed, I feel ashamed. I feel inhibited in how I, per I engage in the world. I have problematic markers in my immune system. I think it's one of the great health risks is when we disempower people. So those were some eureka moments that said, this is the most important dimension of social life that we have to understand. We will certainly follow up on the sexual harassment aspects of yeah. your discoveries later in our conversation. But, but I do want to follow up on another study 
where yeah. you have shown that power can turn people into, wait for it, everybody, cookie monsters. Explain that one to us. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Stephen. That, that was also another eureka moment. Um, you know, I, we got interested in this idea as we started to look at our data in the 1990s that, you know, and you just look out in the world and it's just, it's self-evident almost, which is power makes us impulsive. We lose our sense of social constraint. And then when we're feeling powerful, we're more likely to swear and shout at people and interrupt and, you know, cut in front of people in line. And so we wanted to bring that idea that power makes us impulsive into the lab in a very everyday way. So uh, we did what has come to be called the Cookie Monster Study. And here's what we did. Um, we brought three people to the lab and we randomly assigned one person to the position of power, right? We said, you know, we've, we've, we've decided you're gonna be in charge here. You're gonna kind of control the situation and evaluate these other people. Uh, you're in power. And the person kind of puffs up their chest and they feel powerful. Uh, and then we had them for an hour sort of survey data and write policies for the university, right? So they're writing these policies and kind of doing basic work. Halfway into the study, and this is where the real study begins, we bring a plate of chocolate chip cookies. Uh, these are young people. Everybody takes a chocolate chip cookie. So our key question, our first question was, who takes the last cookie? <laughs> and in fact, uh, most typically it was the high power person randomly assigned who reaches out, grabs a cookie and takes it. Uh, and then my grad student had this brilliant observation. He said, you know, I think power is actually influencing how people eat their cookies. So Steve, we spent months coding these videotapes uh, and what we found, people randomly assigned to a position of power are more likely to be eating their cookies with their mouths open, lips smacking, cookie crumbs literally falling onto their sweaters, right? Uh, it just sort of releases these impulses uh, in this case, just I want to eat these cookies as quickly as possible. It's such an interesting observation because it is so much a part of the social code that you don't take the last cookie, right? And yet it, you knew who the powerful people were and they went right for it, didn't they? Yeah, you know, Steve, that's such an insightful comment because really what, what as a psychologist, what I'm most interested in in some sense is we have this rich layer of norms and morals and ethical codes that guides social behavior, right? How do you eat? How do you address people? How do you engage in a civil conversation? What language do you use if you're talking with uh, somebody who's feeling intimidated by you or somebody who's feeling comfortable? How do you drive your car? This, these are the norms that hold society together. And in every study we, we've engaged in, power leads people to violate those social codes. If, I, I have to tell you this other study, and it's another aha moment. Um, you know, this study dealt with driving. How do you drive your car? We position a UC Berkeley undergraduate on a street by what's called a pedestrian zone. There are these zones on American roads where, in California roads, where it's the law that you have to stop your car and let a pedestrian cross the street. And we have them here too, crosswalks. Good, yeah, mm -hmm. and I'll bet you, you do a better job of honoring that rule, but <laughs> so we, um, you know, we uh, had this undergraduate standing at the pedestrian zone looking like they want to cross the street, and we simply scored what kind of car is approaching this, this young person, and do they stop and, and play by the rules, or do they violate the law and, and blaze through? Uh, we scored on a one to five scale how powerful your car is. Is it a very poor car that doesn't cost that much? Is it a fancy Mercedes on the other end of this scale? Drivers of the less powerful cheap cars stop 100% of the time. Hmm. Uh, drivers of fancy cars blaze through the pedestrian zone about 50% of the time. Fascinating. Right? So just everywhere you look, where power makes us kind of more likely to violate the codes of civil society. Hmm. You are, of course, a psychologist, and I want to ask you about the work of a neuroscientist who is at yeah. McMaster University, Sukhvinder Obi, who lent, yeah. I gather, some support to your findings about empathy and power. What did he find? Yeah, you know, um, as we were doing these studies on the empathy and compassion deficits that power produces, right, uh, with self-report data, do you judge people's emotions uh, well, and power diminishes that ability. 
again, there were these aha moments um, scientifically. And one of them was Sukhvinder Obi did this study. And imagine this, Steve. You know, he just had people think about a time where you felt powerful. Hey, I was on top of my game or powerless. So you've just thought about an experience, experience randomly assigned. And then he has this task where it really measures the mirror system in your brain and in your nervous system more broadly, where you see an image of somebody squeezing a ball, and then he measures electri electrical impulses near your hand, and people kind of reflexively move their hands to imitate the hand that they see. And what he found is that if I recalled an experience where I didn't feel powerful, I imitate somebody else's behavior, the hand squeeze of the ball. If I'm feeling powerful, that mirroring response is shut down. I'm no longer Ooh. syncing up my behavior with other people. Keely Muscatel, another study in the same spirit, she um, looks at what are the parts of the brain that are activated when I'm talking to a friend, right? And Steve, if you tell me about what happened last night and the nice conversation we had with your friends or family, parts of my frontal lobes are activated and what I'm doing is I'm empathizing with you. I'm imagining what it's like. I'm imagining your feelings. I'm listening carefully. And what Keeley found is for people who feel really powerful and they're listening to their friend talk about their day, those parts of the frontal lobes are deactivated, right? Hmm. So these empathy deficits translate all the way down to brain activation. Let's just go through a bit of a checklist here before we move on to yeah. the sexual harassment that has been such a huge part of our world over the yeah. last many months. So we have established that power can reduce empathy, make it more likely to see others as objects. It can yeah. decrease inhibitions, make someone more willing to take risks. And according to research out of Florida State University, those with power can have increased sexual motivations and are more likely to overestimate the sexual interest of others. I mean, if that's not Harvey Weinstein right there, I don't know what yeah. is. So I wonder if you could just pick up on that and talk to us about how, I guess, how he is sort of emblematic of so much of what we've been talking about so far. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, so there was this early science of power that I write about in The Power Paradox, which is it makes you impulsive, right? And that gets really problematic with respect to gender at work, which is if I'm really feeling powerful, I'm more likely to touch people, more likely to get close to them physically, more likely to use suggestive language. We did a study showing you're more likely to flirt in a more direct way, right? So you're kind of expressing, no surprise, this sexual impulse. And then uh, John Maynard has done this work on what he calls sexual overperception, which sheds such profound light on the, the issue of sexual harassment today. And it goes as follows, which is, when you study two people interacting with each other and one of them feels more powerful, one of them has more seniority at work, one of them is more powerful in an intimate relationship, there's this really interesting emotional dynamic that we've documented in my lab too, which is if I feel powerful, I feel good, I feel enthusiastic, I feel desire, desirous, I feel excited. I'm feeling all these positive emotions of attraction. By contrast, we know that the person feeling less powerful, and this is a robust finding that goes all the way down to non-human primates, the less powerful individuals feeling more anxious, more worried, they're attending to the environment really carefully, they're vigilant, they see threat in places. You're feeling agitated and worried and stressed as part of feeling less powerful. Those are the ground truths of the situation or, or how people are feeling. And what John Maynard found is that powerful people have this massive sexual overperception tendency, which is that I'm feeling as a powerful person in an interaction really sexually interested, and then I think other people feel the same way as I do, right? I feel like this young woman I'm interacting with is also sexually interested, they share my feelings, when in fact, objective reality shows, they actually feel more anxious, maybe repulsed by my actions, worried about them, they're pushing me away, and I'm over-perceiving their desire for me because of these biases that are related to power. Somebody should have explained that to these men who have been behaving so badly because, I mean, you yeah. talk about objective reality. I don't mean to be mean here, but I think it is objectively real to say 
uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein or Bill O'Reilly yeah. or Charlie Rose, these guys are not fashion models, right? These are, these are <laughs> again, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here, but, but clearly something, something is misfiring in their brains to make them think that they are the object of women's desire when clearly you've got a perfect mismatch storm happening here. Is that right? I, I mean, Steve, it is astonishing as I've been part of these conversations about sexual harassment, and it speaks to how deep the biases, the narcissistic biases are that are associated with power, that Harvey Weinstein would think that he's attractive to women, that Louis C.K. and Charlie Rose would think it's really alluring and a source of intimacy to expose your genitals to people that you barely know. I mean, it is astonishing um, how myopic power makes people and I think that's why this science is so important. It's so important for the broader public to know that if you're feeling less powerful, it's not a source of attraction and interest. It's a source of anxiety and concern. And so when Henry Kissinger said, you know, and he's another probably an example of all of this, power is the ultimate aphrodisiac, really the truth of that statement is, yeah, it's, it's sexually arousing for people who have power, but much less so for people around them. Well, let's ask what I hope is a, is, is a truly relevant question here, which is yeah. in terms of research, is there a difference between how power influences men versus women? Yeah. You know, Steve, this is, I think this is the deepest question right now uh, with respect to the power literature and the science uh, is just starting to look into things. We are in a power and gender revolution, um, notwithstanding you know, what has happened in the United States to a certain extent. So it, you know, I think it's fair to say when you look at how women are rising in medicine and in law and in academics and running universities and politics in many countries in the world um, and in the dissemination of knowledge, women have more power today, although they are woefully underpaid for their work, they have more power today than in the past 15,000 years. Hmm. This is a revolutionary moment, right? Um, and so that begs the question of, do these laws of power, the abuses of power, apply to women as, as they do to men? And I used to say, yeah, they do. You know, And, and there are data that suggests that, um, that women are just as likely to show compassion deficits or empathy deficits if they feel powerful. But I think there are going to be really interesting differences that we should keep an eye on. Um, so we know, for example, there are recent data showing as women rise in government structures, the more women that are involved in the government, the less corruption there is in the government, right? So that's interesting that women lead within governmental institutions, perhaps in a different way, more likely to be attending to other people's interests. Uh, there are data showing uh, from a really important Credit Suisse study, that the more women that there are on corporate boards, the less likely you are to see these really outlandish, financially risky moves that often cost companies, right? That led to the financial collapse, uh, US and worldwide, 2008. So there are preliminary data that suggest maybe there's reason for hope uh, that as women rise in social hierarchies, we're going to see a little bit less of the abuse of power. Uh, th this is always the standard comeback to that kind of a statement, which is, <laughs> yes, but Margaret Thatcher and Indira Gandhi and Golda Meir were all female world leaders who sent troops yeah. into battle and yeah. demonstrated many of the same attributes that men did while they were in power. So therefore, how do we explain that? Well, you know, this is why this is a, such a, a pivotal moment, right, which is I think in the next 10 years, we're going to have historical changes where we have enough women in these upper echelons of power to really make the historical case. Like, how do uh, women lead as, you know, as uh, prime ministers or presidents uh, countries? And we'll have enough data to answer the question. What is it, you know, only, I, I forgot what percentage of women are CEOs in the United States. I think it's 5%. Hmm. What, what are companies like when they're run by women? What is Hollywood like when it's no longer 7% female directors, but rather 40 or 50%? Uh, and will you see the same patterns of sexual abuse? I think we're going to see changes. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 answer 
will will arrive in five to ten years. Time will tell, as they say. Yeah. I do need to yeah. ask you about something though, 180 degrees in the different direction, sure. which is. Nelson Mandela was a powerful man. Nelson Mandela yeah. was, but was both politically the president of South Africa, but he was also yeah. perhaps one of the most powerful moral influences in the history of the world. And he yep. surely did not abuse his power in the way that we have talked about other men abusing power. Is he simply a, an exception to the rule or what do you make of that? Yeah, you know, Steve, that, that, really, is, um, that really is one of these definitive questions in the literature. And I think, you know, I've made the case, perhaps a little over dramatically, that, you know, power leads to these abuses, right, of impulsivity and compassion deficits. And, and you look at, you know, world leaders and military figures and Hollywood stars and, you know, sports figures, and you tend to see these patterns. But you see these really compelling counterexamples, right? Uh, Warren Buffett in the United States, you know, who's still leading a, a modest life in many ways. Nelson Mandela, the Dalai Lama, um, you know, and others. Um, and I think there's this really interesting science by my colleague at Berkeley, Serena Chen, which suggests that it isn't that power, as Lord Acton said, that leads to abuse, but rather that power, as Robert Caro, the great historian of Lyndon Johnson said, power reveals. And there's studies that show, and this fits this dis disinhibition idea, which is that if I feel powerful, I'm going to express my true self, right? So if I'm, you know, always sexually aroused and I go to Hollywood and I gain power, then I'm going to express those sexual tendencies in inappropriate ways. But Serena shows if I'm really kind and generous and empathetic and I gain power, like Abraham Lincoln, for example, I become even kinder and more empathetic. And that may help explain the case of Nelson Mandela. He was a kind of a charismatic and preternaturally kind person. And when he gained such worldwide esteem and power, those tendencies were even more forcefully expressed. And that gives me hope, right? What, what that means is we need kinder people to go to Wall Street. We need kinder people to go into politics. We need kinder people to run police academies uh, as ways to, to curb the abuses of power. Is that part of the paradox referred to in the title of your book? It is, it really is that, you know, there is this striking finding in a lot of different contexts that, you know, people gain the respect of their peers and rise in organizations and communities and military units and by kind of being socially intelligent and emotionally empathetic and then once you get power, a lot of these abuses occur, and that's the paradox, is we get power often by what's good in human nature, and then we lose those things once we have power. In which case, let's finish up on this, because we are, you and I, sir, not going to live in a world without power. Power exists <laughs> and will be used. So what yep. are some of the things that uh, you think of when you think of what needs to happen to break that link between power and abusive behavior? So, you know, I, I mean, I, what I, when you survey the broad literature of power and you think about how costly these abuses are, right? Financial collapses that cost trillions of dollars, sexual harassment that literally is in its coercive fashion constraining the progress of women on a worldwide basis. So I think one is we need a, a you know, just very simply, a more equal distribution of power. We need more women on boards. We need, we need more women in Hollywood running, you know, directing movies. We need more women running companies. And, and I think that that will start to, when you have this diverse and, and more balanced distribution of power to different types of people, you'll get, you'll, you'll constrain certain kinds of abuses of power. I think the second thing that, you know, and, and that's why this conversation is so important, which is that when you study the great dictators, you know, from Stalin to Hitler to, you know, a lot of other figures, one of the things that they immediately go after is the critical commentary upon social institutions and power. They become obsessed with the media, like President Trump. They get really worried about art and rock and roll, right, like uh, Russians, uh, Russian leaders. And so what we have to enable and empower 
are the institutions like art and the academy and the media uh, that critique the, the status quo. And we have to really uh, empower that. And, and it's interesting, you know, just a little political side note. Um, in the United States, we got very worried about the, the behavior and still are the behavior of President Trump. And the media uh, is energized like it hasn't been in, in a decade or two. Uh, and then I think that we have to um, we have to um, think seriously about uh, the ethical dimension to power, right? And to you know, too often we we and this is the legacy of Machiavelli, who I wrote wrote about a lot in the Power Paradox, which is, oh, power is separate from ethics and being good and kind, and and that's that is a fallacy and it's a very dangerous fallacy when you have power. By definition, you have a lot of influence over other, other people. And so we have to bring ethics into business schools and law schools and the like uh, and med schools, as, as there is increasingly, to get people with power to think about their privileges. Well, I am going to use my vast power right now, the only power <laughs> I have in this world, which is to extend this segment by another 20 seconds so that I can add con control room. Can you put his super up, please? Because the last question I want to ask you is, I've never seen your name anywhere before. Dacker, D-A-C-H-E-R. <laughs> yeah. Where is that from? <laughs> well, I was lucky to be raised by a dad who's an artist and a really creative person who challenged the status quo. And one of the ways he challenged the status quo is he gave me a name. He made up my name. So <laughs> it's uh, not only is it, and you'll never hear it, uh, but it's spelled oddly, D-A-C-H-E-R, so um, I got this unusual name. And you've probably had to explain that every day of your life for the last X number of years. Uh, a mortifying experience through the grammar school years. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Dacker Kellner, it's awfully good of you to join us on the line from Berkeley, California. We remind people the name of the book is The Power Paradox, and we thank you for being on TVO with us tonight. Thanks for such a thoughtful interview, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.